let's let's uh, let's dig in. As you know, tonight's topic is called the long decade of discussion, and what we're about to learn is that in the 1930s something really astonishing happened that is not well known today uh, which is that a, many thousands of people came together for public discussion about the important issues of the day to kind of develop their civic muscle and it's an astonishing story that's what we're going to hear about and we're very lucky that um, <clears throat> In my opinion, uh, the person who knows the most about this in the country, who spent the most time thinking about it, reflecting it, working with the original, resor uh, original sources, is Professor, Professor Timothy Schaefer, um, who teaches at Kansas State University. Uh, and he is also a research specialist at the National Institute for Civil Discourse, which is our co-sponsoring organization. So. Um, uh, I got turned on to this subject through uh, Tim and have become a real addict. So I am really eager to hear uh, the presentation tonight on uh, uh, the long uh, uh, decade of conversation. And what I'm going to ask you to do when you, as you hear Tim is to absorb the things you're learning about history as you also reflect on how it may be relevant to our situation today. Um, okay, so Tim, thanks man for doing this. Over to you. Well, it's really great to be here. I'm just gonna do a little quick uh, share here of a screen and then we're gonna get going. So uh, thanks to Braver Angels and to the National Institute for Civil Discourse and to, uh, um, for having me and for uh, launching the uh, America's Public Forum tonight. So a little bit about me. I'm an associate professor uh, of communication studies and director of the Institute for Civic Discourse and Democracy at Kansas State University, as well as the principal research specialist at NICD. I've, uh, I've been part of four book projects as an editor uh, that all focus on themes of dialogue and deliberation in education, particularly higher ed, this idea of civic professionalism. How do we think about being a professional using uh, our technical expertise in these kind of public regarding ways and relational work, as well as thinking about civility? Uh, and what does that term mean? Uh, kind of complicated now when we think about it as, as it's been used to marginalize and silence certain voices, but importantly, it plays a, a vital role in how we talk and share our problems. And so uh, what I wanna talk about tonight is um, the long 1930s, which uh, for our purposes really begins with the progressive era and then largely concludes with World War II. It begins with this kind of embrace, embrace of liberalism, managerialism, expertise, uh, kind of in relationship and, and tension with these democratic practices and ends, which lead to the demise in some ways of some of this democratic movement in a significant way as we transition to a world that was at war as well as one that uh, had little interest in some of the civic and cultural cultivation of these kind of conversations that we'll talk about in a little bit. But what I wanna start with here a bit is the, the fact that earlier this year, the New Yorker had this story. And it was a reminder that many people have kind of a lack of familiarity with this earlier chapter in American history. And significantly, it can help us think about some of our own world today. One of the images from that story in January comes from Mussolini who said in, in 1922, um, uh, marching on Rome and then a decade later saying, right, the, this liberal state is destined to perish. And a lot of people had deep concerns around some of the future of democracy. Arnold uh, Toynbee who wrote in 19, uh, it was published in 1932, this, this kind of quote, right? This sense of, of people were concerned about the, the Western system of society breaking down or possibly not even working. And there was really this broader public discussion taking place about how best to address and respond to the challenges uh, that were economic, social, and political that raised questions and fears about the future of democracy in the face of fascism and other forms of kind of political association. So economics and politics were changing. And one response was to engage civic adult education and public discussion around the problems of and in democracy. We can unpack that a little bit later. But we have many examples from this period, from 1934 to 1940, the images on here 
are coming from youth members in a German-American Bund camp raising a flag at half-mast in tribute to Nazi Germany's late president Hindenburg in 1934. This was in New Jersey. A rally for American, uh, Americanism conducted by the KKK and again the German-American Bund in New Jersey in 1940. And then at the very bottom, a crowd saluting cadets, again, of the German-American Bund parade in Long Island in 1937. So we have these experiences in 19, um, uh, in, in, in the early 1930s and into the 40s. In 2017, a very short documentary was, was made called A Night in the Garden. This picture is from February 20th, 1939. 22,000 people packed Madison Square Garden. The following day, the New York Times had this headline. The possibility or aspiration for fascism in the United States elevated for many the need to practice democracy rather than simply talk about democracy. Fortunately, there have some been uh, some really good examples of this in our longer past, and that's really what I want to talk about tonight. So there are a couple framing things here at the very beginning. I want to talk a little bit about the roots of kind of discussion in American civic life and where it intersects with this idea of education. But first, the roots. So the image on the left is from a town meeting warrant in uh, 1750 from Arlington, Massachusetts. And on the right is the second meeting house in Salem that was used from 1701 to 1785. Town meetings were and are one of the most important elements of the democratic story in, in America, but they were shaped by their times defining who was and wasn't a citizen and how those individuals were to participate in decision making. And open assemblies were at the center of this decision making process at the town level where these, where these people met in a specific place to discuss and resolve their community affairs. While decisions were taking place by vote, debate played an important role in resolving these political issues. And most importantly, the expression, quote, town meeting has been used to denote other types of meetings where public matters were discussed, but which no public uh, decision making uh, power was in play. And so this is an important piece to note here, especially when we talk about some of the history and the roots of this work is the New England town meeting had a very particular reason for existing. But when we think about both the grassroots and some of the institutions that were kind of fostering some of this work, it's really important for us and some of the work I will, I will note a lot of the, the references I've tried to include the citations or actually the, the, the titles of the works that are, are relevant here, um, is that citizens were experiencing this in both formal and informal spaces, the town meetings, lyceums and the Chautauqua and the Chautauqua movement, social centers and settlement houses and the like. These were grassroots efforts but there are also these really important roles of a handful of institutions in kind of creating these opportunities and outlets for this expression. They were creating space for democracy. And what's particularly important is to think about the role and these efforts of democratizing this as uh, um, has been said by Sirianni and Friedland talking about the civic innovation as uh, how do we create these new institutions in our lives. And one really important one before we kind of jump into the 1930s, this is that long early part is to look at the late 19th century and the early 20th century as a moment of transition. William Keith writes a phenomenal book, and I would encourage, if you're interested in this era, to pick this one up. By 1920, the US population was changing. Uh, it was becoming more urban. It was more diverse. The idea of the kind of the local corner store, the, um, the, the kind of cracker barrel conversations were largely uh, becoming challenged when we think about just li literally the sheer numbers in the space. And so when we ask this question, you know, what do we do next? Bill Keith has this response. The answer lies in this discussion movement, this widespread idea in the 20th century that a particular kind of communication discussion would solve our political problems. A couple of these examples, uh, these formal speaking events in a place called Ford Hall, uh, very famously, you can uh, look quite a bit up about it, and the broader open forum movement, as well as these kind of small local events through social centers had great interest. In 1911, Woodrow Wilson told the first national conference on social center development that the centers offered the possibility of, quote, the restoration of the unity of communities. And these cooperative small um, groups uh, were, were solving problems in the 1920s and 30s, drawing on scholars such as John Dewey and Mary Parker Follett and the public forum movement. And this was an outgrowth from, but importantly, an alternative to some of the debate framework that we would, we would think of and see today. And so 
Uh, Goodman has done a lot of great work in this area. But one of the voices that I want to highlight here that's uh, largely forgotten from much of this work is Mary Parker Follett. This is a quote from her book, Creative Experience from 1924, where she says, in a small group, this is where we shall find the inner meaning of democracy, its heart and its core. And literally probably one of my favorite all time quotes uh, later from that book is on this page. And I'm gonna just say a little bit uh, in addition to this. Follett's contribution to early 20th century thought, especially in regards to the relationship between individuals and others in group settings is significant. The intro to her book, uh, 1918 book, The New State, she wrote, representative democracy has failed. The individual citizen was not valued enough in this model of democracy. We sought to find him through the method of rep representation and, and failed to find him. But calls for direct democracy were inadequate and were a mere phantom. This was because democracy was not a sum in addition. Democracy is not brute numbers. It is a genuine union of true individuals. Later, she would, she would say that democracy is an infinitely including spirit. We have an instinct for democracy because we have an instinct for wholeness. We get wholeness only through reciprocal relations, through infinitely expanding reciprocal relations. Democracy is really neither extending nor including merely, but creating wholes. This desire for relationships and wholeness would continue to animate her thinking uh, around what Andrew Jewett would, would call Follett's proposed system of face-to-face -face discussion groups and what we would now today refer to as deliberative democracy. So the second piece that kind of relates to this kind of long history of these roots is this emergence of something called adult education and where it converges with civic education and forums. And for us, uh, an important piece here is the adult education movement was really born in the 1920s because of the Carnegie Corporation. It had interest in bringing together what were um, uh, kind of emerging uh, kind of areas into a, to a new field of study and they had resources to do it. So I wanna briefly highlight one chapter in the, the forum um, movement here in just a moment in New York and, and Harlem specifically. But the Carnegie Corporation established in 26 this association it becomes this home and there's an intellectual kind of vibrancy that a lot of people end up uh, kind of engaging in in a, range of, in a range of ways. But when we look at Harlem, maybe not one of the first examples that we think of when we think of the 1930s and a, and a space for deliberation or for dialogue, um, but Macalini's In the Cause of Freedom writes this, a walk down the street in Harlem or a lunch break in a park often brought one with an earshot of a speaker who unraveled the relationship between Southern lynchings, unsanitary tenement housing, the global conflicts over African colonies, and social clubs, fraternal lodges, beauty salons, and barber shops, as well as a local sporting event. People would discuss a dynamic minister's proselytizing about the poor Southern migrants and the Caribbean immigrants, or W.E.B. Du Bois' most recent critical editorial. Some wonderful work in this area by Amado Nocera, uh, a very recent publication just from March of this year, talks about, and this is a vivid image, um, these kind of street preachers who would be uh, kind of speaking and the forums took form from some of this, right? That the traffic was bumping up right against them, frighteningly close to the, hit the outskirts of these groups. And I love the last line that comes from the Associated Negro Press, a story from August 23, uh, 1926, referring to these people. The age of Pericles and Socrates has nothing on the present age in Harlem. This education for people was significant. It was an event. Notice the attire. I'm, uh, I'm not dressed up like that right now. And I imagine many of you aren't here on this Zoom. But this was an image from Hubert Harrison's World Problems of Race, a course that he was teaching that was really designed as a forum uh, kind of process in December of 26. And as Nocera writes, Hubert Harrison, an Afro-Caribbean socialist and atheist was considered Harlem's most famous order during the 1920s. And according to one confidential informant for the Bureau of Investigation, the precursor to the FBI, the People's Education Forum was, quote, the greatest school for teaching of Bolshevikism among Negroes, end quote. Indeed, for members of the PEF, the format of the forum, particularly the inclusion of audience discussion, symbolized the group's radical commitments. Rejecting the perceived elitism of lectures, organizers proclaimed that the proceedings of the PEF were absolutely democratic. By the time the Harlem experiment began in 1931, Harlem was famous for its forums. So as we transition now really looking at the 1930s and to the early 40s, right, the crash of 29, the Great Depression, it's helpful to be reminded of where we were. 
1937, Life magazine ran this famous photograph of a black, uh, a black flood victim standing in front of a sign which declared the world's highest standard of living, showing a white family. People were questioning the longevity and staying power of democracy. Other countries were experimenting with different forms of governance, and this didn't only happen elsewhere, as was noted just a bit ago. The rise of fascism and communism created an opportunity to kind of double down on this idea of democracy. And so when we look at uh, the 1930s, a really dominant narrative is one that's shaped by experimenting and an expert-driven kind of idea of government. The establish of, establishment of new government institutions through legislation led to, the led to the explosion of what were referred to as the alphabet agencies. Uh, within a couple uh, months, for example, the Agricultural Adjustment Act, which had a huge impact on rural uh, communities, was, was passed. So some people viewed this positively. Uh, while others did not. Not a clear sense of what was being done and why, right? So the path forward was uncertain for a lot of people. And sometimes there was outward opposition to the idea of a lot of what was going on. As Richard Hofstadter said in the American political tradition and the men who made it, quote, the people wanted experiment, activity, trial and error, anything that would convey a sense of movement and novelty. But this was not uniformly accepted. So in the midst, in the midst of all of this, the diverse forms of discussion methods emerged as an alternative to kind of the sage on the stage and traditional lecture formats, or even this idea that government was really driven by expertise. And so we have a number of volumes that are published during this time. And I just include one here because it was one of these classic kind of texts that was available at the period of discussion methods. And so what you can see here is one of the charts from this book that talked about really the breadth of this work of the idea of not just debates, but really thinking about panels and forums. It's kind of foreign to us to think about a panel discussion being a, a relatively novel idea. But at this period, it really was, right? That people were really accustomed to, to that lecture style in contrast to more of a conversational one. And one of the, the most important voices in all of this is John Ward Studebaker, the individual on the left. He plays a central role in this story. He was the principal in Des Moines, Iowa, and then later served from 1934 to 1948 as commissioner of education and the federal government. He developed and then expanded what would become known as the Studebaker forms. And so what we see, um, what we see here in the next few slides, I'm just gonna kind of go over a few of these images without saying much about them, but were a range of topics that were hosted in neighborhood schools and kind of after our evenings, you can see the times eight o'clock on October 28th, the idea of a whole host of conversations occurring in these Des Moines public forums for youth and for adults, and a range of topics. And so the forums, they move from Des Moines kind of uh, to sites across the country. It becomes known as the Federal Forum Project. And so there are a lot of um, uh, kind of local stories, and I'll highlight some of this, and it was wonderful to hear where people were from earlier because some of your own communities or relatively close were involved with some of this work. But what made some of this possible was radio. It was an emerging technology and played a really important supporting role in these face-to-face -face discussions in the Federal Forum Project. And so when we look at the United States, we can see at that period of time a real clustering in population in a certain segment of the country, whereas others were, were more remote and, and, and maybe challenged. But radio reduced some of that distance, right? The enthusiasm for radio education during this early day, uh, the early days of this was really palatable. Um, it was palpable. Many universities, especially land grants, set up these stations in order to provide kind of technical information, these public services like weather and market reports. But the idea of extending the benefits of these universities to all citizens through radio was really widespread because it would bring kind of these modern practices, but also an opportunity for people to become aware of and part of larger conversations. And so we, we see the use of, of this and, and the images here I'm gonna kind of speak about here for a moment. The images um, ab above uh, are really about engagement in addition to this face-to-face, -face, right? So radio was being leveraged to create opportunities to think about public affairs from a variety of perspectives full, before fully embracing the panel discussion of experts or talking heads and pundits. Radio was envisioned to be a platform for discussion and kind of a town hall to reach wider audiences with programs such as George Denny's America's Town Meeting, Lyman Bryson's People's Full Platform and the University of Chicago's Roundtable. These were just exa a few examples of these programs serving as models of public discussion or the lack thereof sometimes through radio. 
and the critiques of the commercial broadcast kind of platform came into stark relief when thinking about really the role of radio and its in, uh, kind of integrity of programming for public purposes that were beyond commercial. We see this happening in rural communities. I'll talk about farmer discussion groups in just a little bit. Um, but this was a central piece that allowed the USDA to engage the individuals at the local level. So it was not just kind of a national broadcasting, the, the idea of the radio being a platform for that, but it was also hyper-local because of the proximity of these stations. So when we think about these public forums, it becomes really these kind of public forum centers. The radio project becomes a, a, an amazing resor resource for making this possible to the, to the point, and I include these numbers just because it's really dramatic, that they would get 6,000 letters a week basically saying how appreciative they were of the opportunity to be able to hear some of this, to be able to think critically uh, in some of these nuanced ways from a range of speakers, right? But there was an acknowledgement that some of this um, was, was maybe limited or that there was an opportunity that could be kind of expanded here. Um, Studebaker says this, right? These funds really permitted the government to have some leadership and with some necessary assistance in this work, this educational work. And the civic education through public forums promises, as he says, to be one of the most effective social inventions for the improvement of self-government. It is real economy to discover practical methods to civic education through public forums because civic education can save our adult people from unsound and hence expensive political decisions. So it wasn't just about novelty of a topic, but it really was seen as a very practical way for people to improve their lives and the lives of others across the country. One really good example of this comes from Milwaukee. Um, there's a, a wonderful report, a, a shot of this reintroduction on the right, uh, but there's a statement in there that included everybody from quote, the farmhand to the millionaire. It was, one of, it was the largest city to have one of these forums that was part of this project, but they were all kind of framed under this language of education for democracy which were designed as an institution devoted to a courageous program of presenting all sides of important issues, providing an opportunity for absolutely free inquiry into important pro public problems. The New York Times ran a story on this and they called it Beacon Lights of Democracy, set of lights in the darkness. And if you can see on the right side of the screen, that heading, this was all an anecdote to dictatorship. So I wanna spend the last little bit of time that I have tonight to focus in on, and you can see some of those communities here. I'll just stay on this for a second so you can see some of your own uh, maybe regional areas that were involved. I'm gonna talk about a, a particular example that is even less, more or less, uh, uh, more obscure, kind of less known than what's been talked about with the Studebaker forums. And I wanna talk about this chapter from the 1930s about the USDA and specifically cooperative extension agents. And in addition to tending to plant genetics and animal health and home economics, extension cultivated this really vibrant expression of civic life through the use of group discussion. And, and so there's a number of publications that I wanna highlight here uh, that I think are really relevant and then the substance of it. In the midst of the traditional work of the land grant university engaging in this kind of expert driven research, they were also embracing the importance of being able to engage others through public discussion this is actually a shot that I took a few years ago in our library here at Kansas State. So in the midst of all these circulars, which were are these very kind of technical reports, there's this little uh, little handbook, this manual, and on the, the shot on the right shows the title, right? This manual for group discussion. So in the midst of all this technical work, there was this uh, really interesting period in time where they saw group discussion being central and essential uh, to the work that they were doing collectively. And, so, and one of the people who really helped make this uh, possible and happen was Emma Wilson, the individual on the right. Uh, he was central to, to shaping this. The epigraph to his book, Democracy Has Roots from 1939, captures this. Dedicating a lot of his work to, to those who were finding new ways and new methods to make democracy work. The beginning of this project though has some really simple origins. It largely was framed around this idea that maybe we haven't thought as a, as a government Think about it this way from the federal government. Maybe we haven't thought enough about the farmer as a citizen, right? We haven't thought about the ordinary person. And as he says at the bottom of this quote, they wanna, they wanna talk about things. They wanna figure out what it means. And everybody was kind of hearing this. So they experimented a handful of states that were representative of the diverse regions of the country for a kind of composition of who they were as well as what they did. Think again about kind of agricultural production. They convened in early 1935. Just a few months later, M.L. Wilson writes this little essay. This is literally it. It's, it's a one-pager. 
um, saying discussion time is here. That this idea, as, as he says at the bottom, extension's busy, but this is an opportunity and a challenge too important to overlook. And I think the big takeaway from this that shaped so much of this work was really this idea of free and full discussion being the archstone of democracy. So what do we find from some of this? Examples from this preliminary kind of experiment are grounded in North Carolina, clippings from local conversations. I won't go into the detail, maybe some in the discussion period, but the response to this was really interesting. It, it didn't fall into necessarily kind of liberal conservative categories, but was really grounded in the idea of this opportunity to learn more and to kind of think critically and to have some say was an essential piece. One participant even said, right, this is, um, you know, we've organized what we hope is a permanent discussion group in our county and that there's nothing, you know, worth more than this um, for the land grant colleges. So it's quite a statement for a participant to say this. But related to this in the same period, um, there's a letter to Wilson about all of this idea from Kenyon Butterfield. He was the president of three land grant universities and a central force actually in the creation of the extension system itself. And he says this about this work. I think this discussion project is one of the most significant developments in extension work since the Smith Weaver Act was passed. That was the establishment of extension in 1914. I've been waiting for a long time for someone to take the initiative in this field. So what does it look like? There were discussion groups that were topical uh, materials and I'll, I'll show some examples of that. They were used primarily in rural communities, but not exclusively. And the USDA just produced and printed these things and mailed them off literally by the thousands. So there were all these kind of requests from local offices saying, we need a thousand copies of this and, and 10,000 of that. Um, but kind of second and related to this were called the schools of philosophy, which were these multi-day trainings, uh, lectures and discussions, uh, kind of introduction to the philosophical, cultural, economic and historical influences that shaped what they referred to as the agricultural problem. So when we think about people's work in the area of agriculture really being influenced by these other dis disciplines was really important. It started as exclusively for extension and then broadened to other leaders and communities. So this is actually one of those discussion guides posed as a question. It was conversational, uh, they, but they were rooted in science and facts about the topic at hand. So there was all these kind of little factoids in these, these uh, relatively small discussion guides, about 15, 20 pages in length uh, typically. But what we, what we can see, um, the range of topics here, is they talked about a lot of things that we maybe ought to be talking about, or we continue to wrestle, put another way, we continue to wrestle with today. Things like taxes, like soil conservation or environmental questions. Questions about trade agreements. What is our future? Tensions between urban and rural communities. And so again, this is another discussion guide. It was not just topics, but it was also how to have conversations. You can see um, the image on, on the right, the diverse group of people around the table, the discussion leader, as well as people who were representative of kind of the different segments of a local community. Again, thinking rural context, um, agricultural kind of uh, environments. But in addition to all of those, they also produced resources that would help people facilitate and lead these conversations. So this was really important, down to the point that they would help people figure out how to set up meetings. So anybody who's ever done anything like this of figuring out how to change, how to set up rooms, how to think about even things like ventilation and lighting, making people comfortable, um, having the leader not kind of be in the front of the room talking at people, learning people's names using blackboards or flip charts as we would think about it now. But Importantly, I want to note there, nine and 10, right? That this was, everyone is to take part. And it was also not a place for people to just kind of stand up and speak at, at one another. The, the, the diagram at this, uh, the bottom of this, I really love too. The idea that you should be able to carry the conversation as a group was important. And the guides helped people think about those issues as well, of how do we kind of stay on track? And I want to do that tonight too. So I'm going to end in just a few minutes. But this whole idea of really providing these very practical resources um, across the country extensively um, was, was, was re really significant when we think about what was going on at the time and where priorities were as a country. Um, this is a guide from 1942, kind of uh, a big um, kind of encapsulation of a lot of these materials. And if you can read the, the, the captions, uh, it's wonderful. The captions are funny, but they're also really insightful. They tell a the truth. If conversation continues over the break as you drink your coffee together, you might carry that discussion forward well beyond the scheduled meeting. And so Wilson, again, that name shows up, said that this work was trying to bring the prior forms of public discussion, some of that I alluded to earlier, the town meetings and the like, 
kind of up to date to the current age. George Gimmel here at Kansas State, my own institution, even said that a specialist in every state working through the extension service could devote full time to this idea of training, uh, training leaders in these discussion methods. And we see it from other places as well. Oklahoma State, the image on the left, shows a whole kind of diagram all the way from the national project, all the way down to the state level, down to the really local level, to where you see the PTAs and the 4-H clubs, uh, the FFAs, uh, church groups, things of this sense. So this idea of it happening at the really local level was significant. And importantly, it wasn't just conversation to have this kind of abstract discussion, but it was really grounded in this idea. And so the image on the right actually is from Wisconsin, where they were seeing this as a connected to land use planning, to where people could have these discussions, inform them to where they could take some actionable steps within their own communities. The second piece to this are these schools of philosophy. These are fascinating. Uh, Carl Tausch, uh, uh, Tosh, who was the leader of this working with Wilson, uh, really talked about this as being a space for learning these kind of truly democratic methods, a place where discussion was wide and free. This idea that the, as, as it says highlighted, the farmer is this natural born philosopher runs kind of counter to the idea of being uh, the expert or the academic who comes into places, but really is grounded in, in, in the sense of community and the knowledge that's really rooted in the sense of place. The agenda for these typically followed a, a regular structure. They were four or five days at most, and you would have a set of lectures, lectures and then discussions kind of following. The next couple of slides are actual images of, of these kinds of formats. And so here's one from Madison. You can see the whole flow. These were very long. So think about the investment of time that took place here. Um, and before I get to the next one, I want to pause uh, here for this letter that um, W.E.B. Uh, B. Du Bois publishes in the Amsterdam News in 1941, talking about just having been involved in one of these in Prairie View in Texas, one of these schools of philosophy that were for, as it's referred to here, a school of philosophy for Negro agricultural workers. And he's a set, he says this is really important and valuable. And as he says in the bottom of one onto the second page there, I put it to you, frankly, friends of Chicago, Washington, and Boston, can you afford to miss this sort of thing and continue to talk sincerely about race relations in America? So there was a whole element, and I'm very conscious of this today, of, of these discussions that were rooted in the context and the place, realizing something as complex as, quote, democracy was being wrestled with even when we were existing kind of in these segregated conversations and spaces. So there is inherently a tension. This is one of those um, uh, kind of agendas for uh, one of these regional schools of philosophy in, in North Carolina, for example. So it might sound really rosy and wonderful, but maybe not surprisingly, there was pushback. Gladys Baker, a wonderful book called The County Agent, written in 1939, has this beautiful quote. I, I, I love it. It's from page 85. I've cited it so many times in my life um, that some people were hesitant to embrace this because, as she says, and I've highlighted there, they were accustomed to parceling out a continuous supply of right answers. So this idea of experts stepping into roles as facilitators and helping convene conversations rather than kind of tell them what to do was a real significant challenge. And so here at the kind of the conclusion, I wanna just note the final discussions that were part of these forums. These are a handful of topics that were produced, these uh, resources that you saw before. They were both deeply practical as expected, as well as big picture. The very last discussion guide for the USDA was on what would become the United Nations in 1945. So I wanna just go over the last couple of slides here, kind of let you kind of glance at this. This was about five months prior to the UN being established. A guide was disseminated in which people could think about what it would mean for a world peace organization and what role dialogue and discussion would have in shaping our future and kind of shared lives. So you can see a lot of similarities, the General Assembly and some of these structures that come into play um, as expected. But for the United States, this was uh, in part, these conversations were happening around the future of what this means. And as this document kind of concludes, we must decide what role does all of this play in our own lives. And so we can think about it really large scale internationally, but we can also think about it in the hyper-local ways of how do we have these discussions. So this work kind of lingers on a little bit beyond the 1930s. It shows up in various places in non-formal and informal education, it also shows up in conversations about leadership and, and group development. 
uh, but it also diminishes because of changing notions of political engagement as well as technology and kind of social changes. Uh, the advent of, of new technologies, television, for example, diminishes radio. The idea of kind of the post-World War II world, world alters this idea of us needing to be able to be together. And so uh, M.L. Wilson, in fact, even goes to do community development internationally in India and other places. So for us today, and to kind of conclude this, we can think about this in this big picture of civil discourse as being following the rules and politeness, or we can say it as Anthony Layden says in the book, A Crisis of Civility, it's about responsiveness to one another. It's about how do we engage each other? How do we think about discussion playing a role even when we disagree that it's no reason for us to stop talking to one another? And as Peter Levine says, deliberation is most valuable when it's connected to work. When citizens bring their expert experience of making things into their discussions and when they take ideas and values from deliberation back to their work. That's what we really want to see. And there are a lot of organizations that are doing some of this, including Braver Angels and the National Institute for Civil Discourse. So I want to just say thank you here. I appreciate you giving me the time that we've had uh, tonight for me to kind of say all of this. And with that, I'm going to uh, kind of turn it back over and, uh, and we'll go from there. Thank you so much, Tim. We have, yeah, we have the jazz hand uh, style here uh, at Braver Angels when we thank somebody for a presentation. Um, well, let's, let's open this up. Um, here are the rules for, for the discussion period. Um, if you want to um, ask a question or make a comment, um, you need to go to the click under participants at the bottom of the screen, click participants, and then uh, go to the bottom of the participants uh, role where you see a little blue hand, a little, a little blue hand that can be clicked. And if you click that blue hand, uh, that means I'd like to ask a question or make a comment. And, and I will, uh, I'm gonna call on as many people as we can to, uh, to do that. When I call on you, um, you, you, um, you unmute yourself uh, and ask your question or make your comment. You have one minute to do this. Uh, and I'm a very loquacious person and I don't think I could even say hello in one minute. But on the 60 second mark, I'm gonna mute you. So really, you take, only take a minute. Um, if I mute you, I might unmute you and say, you might ask you to finish up in 10 seconds. But the point is, keep it to a minute. Um, when Tim says something, um, I'm going to keep him to an answer. I'm going to keep him to about two minutes. So, um, and the purpose of this is really to just let as many people uh, uh, make a point or, or ask a question as, uh, as, as we can. Uh, and if you haven't, uh, if it hasn't really sunk in yet, what we're trying to do tonight is to imitate, to revive the, the sense of group discussion in the way that um, Tim talked about it happening in the 30s. Um, so let's see, um, I see Brenna Bry. So Brenna, if you could unmute yourself and make your comment or ask your question. Yes, I, um, I'm, I'm, I heard you say that uh, when World War II came, there was a, uh, it was some lost interest in this. And at the end, you, you suggested some things like television and I think globalization. I, so that we don't run into this same diminishing of interest. Could you say a little bit more about why you think it faded out? Yeah. No, that's a great question. And I'm going to try to be as uh, pithy as possible, as a colleague here always says. Um, uh, so part of the, the part of the, the response was just the, the transformation of, of the, the necessity of people needing to be together. Of uh, um, one of the things that I didn't say so much here, Chautauqua is a classic example. It was a place of learning, uh, but it was also of entertainment, right? So it was it was a kind of a, a way of socializing and being with others. And so there was an element of this that was it was not just kind of this informational gathering conversation that took place, but it was also a way of people being in relationship with one another. And so when we think about kind of the advent of of kind of the new technologies in the the suburbs, for example, and things that kind of emerged post World War II, 
is one, one, uh, one factor. We, we see actually a similarity with uh, World War I. The, the social centers and the movement, uh, Kevin Matson has written some really wonderful work around this, um, uh, around what was happening in the teens, so Follett and others. But this idea that energies kind of push and go in certain directions. Um, so the, the, the technological kind of social civic changes uh, are, are significant. One of, one of the factors that really comes into play, I didn't say it so much as it related to the USDA work, um, uh, I could have painted it slightly more as a villain, but actually some of this, this project gets kind of whittled down. Um, it costs a fair amount of money to actually print these materials and have staffers around the country training and doing this kind of work. Um, and, and the fact that when this gets paired, Jess Gilbert has done some wonderful uh, research around this. Uh, when this discussion work gets paired with what are, what's described as land use planning, it becomes a powerful force, kind of this grassroots democratic process that challenged some of the, the, the special interest groups, particularly the American Farm Bureau Federation, as the voice of agriculture, this was an alternative to that. So there's actually a whole record in the Senate to where you can see the budget for this office that did this work in the USDA keeps getting cut and cut and cut to where finally it just, it didn't exist anymore. So the fact that like those final discussion guides, what I showed you, that thing from the UN, was as long as that document was. They used to be about 20 pages, right? But they, they became very short and abbreviated in large part because of just the resources. And so when we think about us, uh, where we are today, part of this was a, a, an issue of infrastructure. Um, some, some research that I've done comparison with Gotta some work. close it, Jim. I will close it real fast. In Canada, they had a really institutionalized model of this that still continues at the Cody Institute. The work in the 1930s in the US is, me talking to you about a historical moment. So I'll leave it at that. Hey, thank you. Um, Jean Hinson, if you could unmute yourself and make your comment or ask your question. Jean, you're, uh, yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm muted. Sorry, I don't have video, but I actually experienced something like this and it was through the Agriculture Extension Agent. Mm -hmm. um, I'm in Wisconsin, across, oh, yeah. across Wisconsin. And I saw a notice in the paper and my daughter and I went to a pasture walk. And this was organized, it's facilitated by the county AAG agent, but a particular farmer offers to, uh, he, he, uh, to be the host. And you get there and you stand in this circle and the county AAG agent said, Every, everybody gets a voice, nobody talks at the same time. And we're here to hear about this farmer and changes that he's made to his ag, ag production. It was a dairy farm. And he would, we walked around to different sites on his farm and then we formed the circle every time we got to the walking spot. And it was, um, he said, you know, these are the changes I'm making to improve my production. And um, then the other people uh, had a chance to learn from that, but then they also asked questions and they offer, he would ask a question to them, how do you think I can do this better? And then each person, you know, if a person wanted to, they could jump in and, and, uh, and organize. And I'm, I'm just curious if anybody else has experienced anything like this. My, my daughter's interested in organic, sustainable agriculture. So yeah. she said, hey, mom, let's go. And we went. Yeah. So, so you know, yeah. what, year, what year was that, Gene? Was this recent? Um, this was a year ago. OK. Yeah, so, so um, uh, one of the classic models of, of extension is this kind of demonstration model of education, which is from the beginning actually predates the organization in many ways. Um, I, I, I was going to allude to um, uh, when you started talking, some of the examples, some of the really rich examples that are happening in my own institution at Kansas State, we have a, a, a work around community conversations using these models all, all the way from youth. We have some really rich examples recently of, of middle schoolers who are, are learning facilitation around kind of community issues and using these models. Um, but extension has been uh, one of these institutions that is increasingly embracing some of this. And so I've been part of a planning group uh, for the last few years, this year, 2020 is a weird year, but in 18 uh, and 19, we had um, uh, through the federal uh, USDA office, uh, some funding to create a, a program called Coming Together for Racial Understanding. And so experts kind of in, in both process as well as dealing with issues like race um, and the like, uh, created a workshop for extension agents similar actually to the schools of philosophy so it was a multi-day workshop in in, um, in the, the metro dc area and so we we have contemporary examples of this happening uh, not just in extension it's one of but there are other entities but universities uh, actually um, you know a really good example one of the people on the call tonight martin carcasson is the director of a center at colorado state another land grant 
and these these kind of cultural hubs when we look at the, that that image from the new york times was beacons of light i would suggest that higher education very intentionally um, a number of places are trying to strive towards cultivating this com these types of conversations, training students and community members to be able to facilitate them so they can be responsive to their own issues. So yes, so I'm, I'm really glad to hear your, um, your story um, as well. Yeah, and, and others uh, at other institutions like Lori Britt, I saw she was on at James Madison, really these kind of institutes and centers are, are wonderful, um, wonderful examples of what this looks like today and the possibility of it. Thank you. Um, Harry Boyd, if you could unmute yourself and make your comment or ask a question. Uh, hi, Tim. Good to see you on this. Hi, Harry. Um, so I'm interested in your last point from Peter Levine and also the you know, land use example. Um, what was the relationship, you, would you say, between the, the discussions at Extension and other groups catalyzed and organized and the work people did not not simply in volunteer forms but the work they did as farmers as i think of hubert humphrey's father who had a yep. drugstore in dolan south dakota which he met he met he made into a civic conversation site so could you talk a bit about how um how the work how the, the deliberation led into work and how um, work was informed by deliberative practices. Yeah, a great question. And and um, so Hubert Humphrey, the the corner kind of drugstore, the kind of language of Cracker Barrels. I I've actually cited that in a few places. Is one of these really good examples of as as Keith, uh, William Keith kind of says, as the country kind of grows up beyond the local community. Part of the challenge was how do we think of this at a slightly larger scale? But this interplay between discussion and kind of work. Uh, this idea of public work uh, to, to draw from, from your work, um, um, Harry, is, is I think really important here. And so at this period, the discussion work and, and the language from the federal government really kind of embodied this as well, that they said these discussion, um, these forums, these dis discussion groups were not um, one and the same, but they were to inform the land use policy. So the idea that the people who were shaping decisions about Frankly, as people were learning new practices and figuring out uh, what lands were good for, for production and which ones were not, that they would actually have some say in the local kind of knowledge context, right? The, the alternative to what James Scott talks about is kind of the high modernism, right? This is the low modernism of that period. But it was really rooted in people's knowledge and experience. So it wasn't just this kind of opportunity to learn about something, but it was, it was really a chance to, um, to to have that information inform their kind of practice. So, so this interplay between kind of the dialogue, the deliberation, this conversation with the idea of the work that they're doing was, was ideally and sometimes aspirationally kind of intertwined, but it was not always the case. Um, the, the idea is that this work would be, these processes, these practices would be applicable to a, a wide set of people. The schools of philosophy, one of, the, one of these classic examples, they did a lot of work with local uh, or, or rural libraries, for example, thinking about these as these kind of civic cultural hubs. And we see that today. Libraries are one of the, the last remaining uh, kind of palaces uh, for the people, as a recent book kind of suggests, where people can convene without that sense of needing to buy or purchase to be a consumer, but rather to be a citizen. So the, di the dialogue, the discussion was really interwoven with the idea of work that was to lead to practice, especially at the local level, because that's how these were being organized. Great. Thank you. Um, Laurie Spadaro, is Daro, if you could unmute yourself and say what you'd like to say. Hi, my question is a little bit more kind of technical about the actual discussion. Mm -hmm. um, I've participated in discussions here in Philadelphia with the Philadelphia Thinking Society, where they provide materials ahead of time that you kind of read about and then you go and it's a very well facilitated discussion. I've also taken part in the Braver Angels debates, not the workshops. And I, it seems to me that you come to the debate not with any specific information or materials, but just what you've kind of gathered on your own. In those discussions back that you're referring to, mm -hmm. that you were talking about tonight, were the, were the citizens given information ahead of time as part of the discussion or 
was that kind of just done at the discussion itself? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, and if anybody is familiar, I'll use a, a contemporary, ex a modern example here uh, that might be a, a good reference. The National Issues Forums Institute creates um, discussion guides. They're phenomenal. They're really good. They're kind of nonpartisan in their framing. Um, the historical documents were similar in that way that they were, I actually have one, um, I didn't plan on this. I have a messy professorial office sort of thing, but I have one sitting here on my desk of one, how do farm people live in comparison to city people? It was the se second discussion guide and it was about 20 pages and it has all these charts and materials and the way that it would work is that the, the local agents would request a number of these to be used in their local communities. And, and I've dug around in about 20 archives and the national archives as well and found down to the record of the counties and the communities and sometimes even the people who were participating in these conversations, but also the topics that they were talking about. And so these discussion guides were, as I said, kind of conversational in style. It was almost like a leaning over the fence and being like, hey, neighbor, I've been thinking about this issue. What do you think? And so the, the text of this, the prose, is really kind of natural and flowy, but it's also infused with this kind of factual information. So I'm going to hold something up to the the, the camera here for a moment. It's gonna be hard to see. It's gonna be backwards, but it'll give you a sense of this. And this is about the, the farms who are behind the times and ahead of the times. So you can see those who are with um, electricity and water, uh, radios, telephones, and those without, right? So this kind of information was what was in these guides. And these people would look at this prior to these conversations, ideally, right? From, uh, from practice today, I also know that people show up and they don't necessarily have this preparation or this kind of uh, uh, prior work, but these materials were designed to be resources for that, to where it wasn't just this kind of speculative discussion, that it was really able to say one out of every four people did have electricity or didn't, or right, these kinds of things, or we don't have paved roads for these reasons, and, 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 and stuff like that. So the ability to have informed discussion was really central to this work, as was often the case in some of these other forms as well. Tim, if I could ask a question. Um, Although a lot of the forum movement began in civil society, a lot of it ultimately got uh, taken up in the New Deal and mm -hmm. funded by, the, it was a New Deal uh, activity. In addition, uh, a lot of the speakers were, you know, uh, politically progressive people. And what... I think a rap, I love this whole thing, but I think a rap, if you wanted to criticize it, I think you could say government funded discussion is inherently a bad idea because it'll be a, have a government bias. And B, um, there, for every conservative speaker, there were about eight progressive speakers. So how would you reply to that kind of criticism? That's a great question, and my reply to that would be, this was one of the, um, the most explicit attacks on particularly the USDA forums. It was that this was being done you know, under the auspices of the, of the New Deal, right? The, the federal government was literally in local communities. They had taken over kind of the local extension offices for the AAA and for the other uh, programs that they were doing, Soil Conservation District and the like. Um, but very clearly they said, this is not propaganda. This was designed to be truly, I mean, that, that line, that's why I, I actually said it twice, the free and full discussion as the archstone of democracy was really what guided this work to the extent that the schools of philosophy very intentionally had pretty close to balance um, kind of those in support and those kind of str sometimes really strongly opposed to a lot of the New Deal initiatives as the lecturers. So the the kind of the, the circuit of intellectuals, if you want to think about it that way. Andrew Jewett has done some really wonderful writing about the schools of philosophy. Uh, one of the only examples of this actually. Um, and it was inclusive of people who basically said the, the federal government shouldn't be doing any of these things, right? Not so much the forum conversation, but these other kind of um, these right. action programs. And so, right. so the, the idea of it being um, potentially kind of tainted by being a, a, a government agency doing the work was, I think sometimes very explicitly kind of counterbalanced by this idea of ensuring that these voices were being um, both heard um, and, and fairly influential in this work. And I should note too that by default, these were happening in rural communities. So ideologically, 
they were they were skewing a little bit more uh, kind of conservative that that one fence line post right that this farm is not receiving government relief yeah. was a fairly common kind of sentiment at the time and yeah. so being able to to kind of think about that is I think a helpful piece because it, it could be a lot of this work could be just couched as being utterly kind of as we were talking about today kind of progressive kind of left leaning uh, but it really was. Um, I think a wedding of the kind of free speech ideals, this idea of public discourse yeah. with the idea of action and how do we lead to that. Uh, and it didn't necessarily embody the, the, the principles that were shaping the government policy at the, at the time. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, Joanne Ward, uh, if you could unmute yourself and make your comment or question. Joanne, you need to unmute. while sorry. she worked. Sorry. I got it. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> um, sorry. Um, so I'm a graduate of Kansas State and oh. um, pretty experienced with the uh, extension in the University of Minnesota mm -hmm. as well. Yep. Yep. But I, I would wonder uh, about another thing that wouldn't have been in the 30s and that's restorative justice, mm -hmm. restorative practices. And um, tr talking about conversations, community conversations, communities working together to solve a problem or um, take some action. Um, moving forward from the 30s, 40s, do you see a place for that now? Yeah, so, um, so great question. I mean, this is one of those things where it's not like, um, as much as I like this stuff, and I, if I were to turn my camera and show you all the other shelves over here where a lot of the older material is, uh, I love it. Uh, but I also don't want to necessarily replicate it, right? For the same reasons that I alluded to the statement from W.E.B. Du Bois uh, participating in one of these schools that was segregated, right? And so they're inherently kind of uh, limited by, I think, some of the constraints of the time and, and that were very significant and, and, and real challenges. Interestingly, at the, the end, I, I had one slide of like the long, long 30s as they kind of went on. And part of it was some of these people as the USDA um, and other federal agencies dismantled after the New Deal and after Truman and, and, and really in, into the early 50s and 53 is when like this office that runs this gets truly like shut down and now it does, uh, does surveys exclusively as a way to get people's opinions. If you, you know, that's another conversation. But um, people like Wilson and others go off and do international community development. Some of them come back um, uh, into the United States and, and do work uh, in the 1960s. And so when we think about kind of the, 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 so, the social organizing and things that were going on, community organizing at that time, some of them had kind of uh, aligned going back to this earlier period. Language of restorative justice was not how they talked about it. But there were, I mean, I think this is where I think the contemporary conversations and, and truly as we're looking around the, the country right now, the need to be able to have that is, is grounded in similar themes of like, how do we have these, these important discussions in ways that are framed and kind of contained in ways that they need to be? Um, the phrase of passionate impartiality, uh, again, Martin Carcassin uh, and, and others have used this, uh, I think appropriately, this idea of really caring about process. And this is uh, the unappealing piece of some of this, right? It's about making the system work and so we can talk about what's, what's going on in a culture. And so the problems of and in democracy, as I alluded to earlier, are, are, are that, right? The problems in democracy are the things that would ask us to have restorative justice and yeah. address some of these issues. That the problems of democracy are that we don't have those good spaces or those environments to have that kind of conversation. Thank you. Uh, Julie Bowler, unmute yourself and make your voice heard. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tim. There's something um, comforting, kind of encouraging to recognize the desperation and fear in what drove some of this discussion to come mm -hmm. together in the 30s and, and know that they descended then into World War II and their, some of their darkest fears were almost realized, but yet they're still here. There's a Facebook meme going around that says, I, I miss living in precedented times because <laughs> this, you know, that constant feeling of, is, are we going to be all right? And so it's just a, another good period to look back to. Um, my question is, 
was about the way radio came in mm. um, and played a role. And I noticed, I mean, you were going pretty quickly on some I of the was. slides, but I noticed um, which you had, I mean, it was great. I'm glad it's being recorded. We can go back. But um, I, the parallels with the internet are obvious. And um, just because some on some of the writings, people were talking about how radio was amplifying. In more seconds, Julie. And so what do you see as, compare and contrast the role of the internet to that radio at that time? Yeah, great question. Uh, thanks for your comments. Um, I, I think the, the, the interesting thing there is that radio was right, this kind of new technology, right? There's this whole explosion. You can see it from really small to really big in the, in the 20s into the 30s of who has radios and how it gets used and people convening in these kind of common spaces, this, this kind of shared life. Um, uh, I have a, uh, an article I wrote, uh, it was published last year called Democracy in the Air that um, I, I can figure out a way to, to make sure that people can find this, all of this material. But the, the, the newness of that te technology at the time is kind of similar to how we think about kind of the, the, the new technologies of today. And, and for us, I think one of the takeaways here is um, there's a real richness as we know it right now, for many of us who haven't been out kind of in life with people for a long time, we're missing and longing for those interactions. And at the same time, technology allows us to do what we're doing right now, right? Uh, it's, am it's amazing. So finding a way to wed both technology um, with our, our deep desire to be together is, is a real resource. And so not being a Luddite and, and also not foregoing that, that sense of figuring out how to be kind of human with one another. As, as, mm -hmm. as Mary Parker Follett says, right, it's, it's about this exchange. It's the you and I, and it's the give and take. Uh, it's that kind of wholeness. Um, but yeah, I would, I, would not, um, I would not skew away from it. One of the, the big challenges, and I'll be brief really here, uh, is the, the, the fact that technology has also been one of these, these kind of detrimental um, factors in the way that we think about civic life, right? So the, the, the assets of, of things like Facebook and groups and, and, and the like, places for us to be in conversation, are also really challenged by the fact that um, uh, you can use these platforms to, 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 to kind of spew hate and, and kind of division and, and kind of the, the wrecking of a system of sorts. And so figuring out how to balance it. But yes, um, Wilson talked about that moment as like this kind of moment of, of, of radical change as a new epic uh, uh, for, for, for that time. And for us to be able to, re to remind ourselves that it's um, maybe not quite as on the edge as we think about, but, or maybe we always just kind of live on the edge. So yeah, maybe we yeah. do all kind of long for that moment to not be uh, exciting times. Hey, thanks. Um, I want to ask people in particular, if you would like to, to um, offer comments or questions about the relationship or the kind of lessons learned uh, from tonight's discussion to today. Um, say anything you want to say, but I'm just asking you to spin that around in your mind as we uh, enter this next and last phase of our conversation. And um, Mr. Turner, Daryl Turner, if you could unmute yourself and jump in. Well, that, that is exactly the issue that I wanted to raise, that uh, today uh, we seem to have a lack of the kind of civility that was apparently demonstrated at those forums in the 30s and 40s and that everybody is demonstrating in this conversation here. So uh, at a time when even something like wearing face masks has become a political issue, my question is, is there any potential for using that kind of discussion model today. What, what I have found for decades is that usually the people who are the ones who scream and yell and rant and name call are not the ones who are likely to take part in forums such as these because they've already made their minds up. They don't want to learn from facts. All they want to do is say, I'm right and everybody else is wrong. Can these forums be used as models today as their way to attract people to have decent discussions on controversial issues such as wearing face masks yeah no thanks for the question um, and I would say yes just from looking around and knowing colleagues around the country who are doing this work I think there is a certain expectation right to step into these kinds of conversations the Institute uh, for Civic Discourse and Democracy here at K-State that I direct uh, we have a set of ground rules right and there's a, a, a relatively short list of, of kind of principles that shape our discussions but if you don't abide by those it makes it either impossible 
or, um, or, or maybe even kind of detrimental to kind of engage in those conversations. So you need to be able to step in, some expectation of stepping into that. And that's one of those hurdles uh, that when we think about kind of the partisanship and polarization that has really kind of created this sense of these kind of encampments, we're separated from each other and not inclined to, I mean, at the heart of discussion in these forums was this idea of having some level of knowledge and information, a lot of it kind of grounded in experience, but the potential of learning, this is where education becomes so important um, and potentially altering your position or your view on something. This is uh, a general practice that uh, I think we, when we think about it in kind of a contemporary way, we have to, to, to think of like, what, what, what does it actually mean to, to do that, right? Rather than to say, I think of John Kerry every time somebody says flip-flop, right? Um, a presidential candidate lost it uh, in many ways because uh, it was viewed as altering a position, a view on a position that he had held. In my view, I think that's a really positive thing if you can say why you've done that. And, and this is this is part of the, the kind of the ratcheting up of this kind of staunch positioning of oneself. And so the, the practice from the 30s, as well as a lot of contemporary work today, would tell us that that doesn't have to be the case. And, and very quickly, Wake Forest University did a 10-year study of students who went through training experience of this kind of work as an undergraduate, and they had a control group who didn't. 10 years later, they followed up with them. Regardless of what professions or fields they chose to go into, they had statistically, in, statistically significant differences that found that they were inclined to be more civically engaged, more inclined to be open to engagement with others across kind of these lines of difference. And I say that because this is, this is part of the work that needs to be done. Better Angels is doing it, NICD is doing it, a number of other organizations are really committed to this and doing it as well, is how do we cultivate or create this space for these kinds of conversations? And it's not gonna include everybody. And I think right. we have to also acknowledge it and accept that as well. All right, thank you. Uh, Donna Murphy, if you could unmute yourself and speak up. Yeah, so the name of this book that David gave me was called The American Way, Democracy at Work in the Des Moines Forums by yep. John Studebaker, who you were Nin talking about. 1936, I believe, correct? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Well, 1935. 35, um, yep. There's, yeah, the okay. plain talk is 36. Anyway, it's, it's beautiful. It's wonderful. Um, it really is uh, civic mindedness. I mean, he really believes that by helping to educate adults, this is at a time when few people went to college. Um, and, and, and educate and also give this opportunity that there would be um, training and tolerance and open-mindedness and critical thinking, right? And, and here's a quote I wanted to read that he says that mass ignorance breaks down under discussion, expert in information and stimulus to thought and reading. No educational experience is more salutary than to try to trot one's pet ideas out on a track where the field is fast and the public is looking on. Okay, it's how lovely. And, you know, really, I, I think they, they did um, triumph in the sense of, of fighting back fascism and uh, communism in the United States. But here we are now, where most people have some kind of uh, post high school education. Uh, and we have uh, talk radio and cable news shows. And we have this like race to the bottom in terms of conspiracy theories and in terms of, you know, it's, uh, it's fake news. Uh, I can believe what I want to believe. And I don't know how, so how do you, what do you do? <laughs> how do we, how do we get back to where we were in the 1930s with this amazing civic mindedness? Well, um, just, Tim, if I could, yeah. sorry, just um, chair's prerogative to butt in, um, to add to what Donna said. Um, what struck me after reading so many books and long conversations with you is that these people were serious about using this to develop civic muscle. They mm -hmm. saw this as citizenship. They saw this as a responsibility of being an American citizen to get, it wasn't like, oh, I'd be interested in learning. I'd be interested in, you know, developing my, you know, it wasn't like they weren't consumers. They were citizens. And they thought of this as becoming better citizens. And to me, that's what I'm looking to, like, where do we, re, how do we recapture that? So that's sort of my way of asking Donna's question. And, and yeah. I want to add, how do we, um, a lot to the fact that um, there's money to be made by keeping us polarized. There's money to be made uh, by, by spreading untruths uh, on the internet and on talk, talk radio. Yeah. Um, 
I don't know how long I've got on this one, David. Two minutes. I don't, I don't think much. Yeah, we're running. We're, we're watching the clock. Um, that book is right up there, by the way. Um, pointing it right there. I'm looking backwards. Okay. okay. Um, but um, but yes, and so uh, I, actually, I mean, Tim, take yeah. take three minutes. Those okay. Were, that's a big question. That is a big question. Okay. Just so say a minute about it. Yeah. So one of the one of the things um, you know, referencing uh, you know the, the book by um, by Studebaker, the American Way. It really was grounded, I mean, as David said a moment ago, right, about this idea of not just kind of like a, an intellectual curiosity, but it was really rooted in this sense of how do we think about the questions that are salient and relevant to us. So in the Des Moines forums, as they're talking about what's the future of democracy, it wasn't just some kind of hypothetical question that... Um, that, that quote from, from 31 that was published in 32 by Toynbee of, you know, countries are kind of falling to, to, to these kind of fascist ideologies. Like, what does this mean? And so this was really rooted in this deep sense of like, if we want to sustain democracy, we need more democracy and we need to practice democracy. And one of the ways to do this was to offer a counter. Um, you know, a lot of this was influenced by Dewey, who was offering this really grand, kind of grounded notion in contrast to someone like Walter Lippmann, who taught, talked about, I, I referenced it, uh, without kind of citing him, but like this kind of phantom public, right? That life is too complex. And so you need to just kind of live your life. This is why we have experts who can take care of it. You go to the voting box every few years. Um, you know, Carl Tosh and, and ML Wilson talk about this, that, you know, we can't think about democracy as going to a ballot box every two or four years and kind of choosing that way. That's an essential piece to the puzzle, but it's not the whole thing. It's only in a, in a, in a significant way, it's the, it's the basic form of being a democratic citizen. You know, Studebaker talks in 1942, he publishes this little essay called Beacon Lights in a Murky World, kind of echoing that language of that New York Times piece, those beacon lights of democracy. They really, you know, Studebaker and Wilson and others at this time really were committed to these, these ideals um, and not just in some aspirational way. They, they saw it as such, but it was really rooted in this sense of practice of what, how do we do this? How do we kind of engage this? Which is frankly why the USDA becomes so important because as they continue to do uh, in, in just about every state, there are local extension educators in every community, every, every county at least, uh, a few of them. And so when we think about it, it's, that, it's why they leaned on them in the 1930s. They said, we've got these people in these communities. What if we actually educate them in some of these processes and they can do this? And so the, the, you know, the, the Des Moines forums, the Studebaker forums were a little bit more kind of lecture and kind of Q&A discussion type structures. But these, these farmer discussion groups were really rooted in people meeting in Grange halls and in front rooms. The image for the event tonight is a real photo from Iowa of this period, 1935, of people meeting in the front room of a home to have these conversations, right? So it was, it was real, it was kind of happening. And so the idea of, of kind of, kind of re-engaging these questions in a forward-facing way is really significant. The fact that, um, Peter Levine, uh, the quote at the end, we are the ones we have been waiting for coming from that book. The subtitle is about kind of civic renewal. And he says, and I would argue this in the same way, we can't just kind of go back to some other time. We can learn from that and, and draw from those, those periods and those chapters that we've kind of forgotten about. But this idea of kind of moving forward is an essential piece for us. And so as much as I, 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 I cherish, I think this work and this period of being able to reclaim it in certain ways, it has to be a building stone to going forward. So it's not just you know, pulling the discussion guides and, 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 and saying we need to talk about this now in, in a contemporary way, but it, it really is building on and leveraging this deep, for me, the driving commitment is what that, that epigraph from Democracy Has Roots book, right? This is committed, this is rooted in the idea that everybody, as he says, to those who have faith in democracy, calls forth new methods to make it work. I think collectively, we're the people who are making it work. Thank you. Uh, as we move toward the close, I would like to ask um, Cynthia Deal to unmute and uh, say what you want to say, Cynthia. Uh, Cynthia, you're... I'm, yeah, I'm working at it. <laughs> All right. How do, oh, here we go. There we go. Now you're muted again. Cynthia, you're muted. Okay. okay. All right. So I guess as I'm listening to everyone, I'm wondering... Maybe this isn't a question just for Timothy, but maybe, or Tim, maybe other people too. What's at the root of it? You know, because I, I, I feel like we're looking at results. You know, for example, a lady I know goes to my church running for 
state house, I guess. No openness at all. I said, oh, would you like to come to Better Angels? No, not doing that at all. You know, I just, what's at, what's at the, what's at the root of it? You know, I feel, I feel like we're dealing, and this is just where I'm coming from. We're dealing with the results of something else. Like some you kind mean, of, Cynthia, of spiritual the, oppression or something. The root of the problem, uh, the root of the problem that we're wrestling with of the rancor. Yeah. Tim, take about four seconds and tell us what's at the root of it all. Four. Very good. Thanks. Yeah. And then I just I'm going to ask Harry Boyd to take another four seconds. Yeah. What's it? Good. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That, that, that's, that's a great tag team. I'll, I'll, I'll let Harry take, do the heavy <laughs> moment. But uh, so quickly, really fast here, people like, um, I didn't mention his name, but uh, Henry Wallace, who was the secretary of the USDA at this time, was really championing this work. He and Wilson and others were shaped by, like, say, the social gospel, you know, so this idea that they were really rooted in this sense of relationship and care for others. They were all kind of growing up in these kind of flat Protestant churches in the Midwest, right? So the, this idea of, of, of relationship and care for one another. Uh, Wilson has these great um, kind of reflections on this later in his life that saying, like, the experience of church for him was was what informed this idea that people need to be able to talk and engage with one another. So yeah. there was a real deep sense of 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 what it meant to be in in the world and in relationship to other people that was influencing yeah. it. So it wasn't just this desire of making a discussion guide. It was something yeah. more. Yeah, there was a spiritual dimension to it. Yeah, Harry, what's what's the root of the whole thing? Oh, well, I think one thing that is common in the '30s and earlier progressives than today are the metaphors we use to talk about politics. So uh, Francis Perkins and the labor secretary and Henry Wallace and um, the CCC folks who drew on William James, they all saw themselves as an alternative to a war metaphor. It was not a combative us versus them, big state is gonna solve the problem. It's more horizontal as people working together and talking together to solve our problems. So it's a citizen-centered metaphor. I'd call it a metaphor of deliberative public work. That's gotten worse. Everything today yeah. in the dominant culture is war metaphors. And this is not only Donald Trump. When the, when the Green New Deal was announced by <clears throat> uh, Cortez and, and uh, Bernie Sanders and others, they said, this is a war. We're in a war. And if you think about it, war language has really taken over. I mean, we have war and crime. We have war and poverty. We have climate wars. We have justice warriors. We have partisan warriors. So we need to actually dethrone the war metaphor and get back to the notion of democracy is about our deliberative, collective, cooperative work on our common problems. That's what I'd say. Yeah. Um, Thank you. I hear everybody. I feel that jazz hands need to be raised here to thank uh, Harry for that last comment and Tim for our, being our leader tonight and all of the comments that were made. I, I think we owe ourselves a little round of, uh, of jazz thank yous. Um, uh, I want to close this out, take about two more minutes of your time, and then we'll adjourn. Um, I want to ask you uh, to pay a little attention, if you will, to the National Institute for Civil Discourse. And Tim, do you have the uh, website? Yep, I'll pull it up you right can now. Share? Okay, so um, you see the website at the bottom and the National Institute for Civil Discourse, where, where Tim has an affiliation, is one of the nation's leading organizations um, to, uh, uh, to, 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 to resume and deepen and build upon the values that we've been talking about for the last uh, hour and 20 minutes. And they're led by wonderful people. And, and if you visit that website, uh, nicd.arizona.edu, you can learn more about Tim's work. You can learn more about a number of really great projects. They have a program called Common Sense American where you can go online and sign up to be a part of a discussion of policy and you're mixing it up with people who have a lot of different opinions. So try that out. Um, 
the other co-sponsor of tonight's uh, program is Braver Angels. That's the organization that I uh, work for. And the, it's braverangels.org. And we have many uh, events and activities. And uh, our mission is to, uh, our, our dream really is a society with less rancor and more goodwill uh, in our politics and in our institutions. So if that's a vision that you have, um, I would invite you to visit braverangels.org and, um, and consider, uh, consider getting involved, consider joining and, and participating in some way. So um, with those two plugs, um, I, wanna, I wanna bring this to a close um, by, I guess, um, saying that as I have dug into this material, I've been a little bit awed by the fact that I've been doing this work a while and I didn't realize I was standing on other people's shoulders, you know, that I, that there was, there were many, many people who were, were wrestling and working with these same issues. Sometimes they failed. Sometimes they made terrible mistakes. Often enough, they succeeded in doing very inspirational and wonderful things. And Today, the work that we're doing, those of us on this meeting, the work that we're doing, we're, we're in a sense standing on their shoulders. Um, not in, you know, and as Tim said, it's not that we want to imitate them or there was a many flaws and many problems with that era as there is are with any era, but there's a sense of respect that I've developed um, for what they've done and what we can learn for it, from it that may help us do a better job today. So um, on that note, I want to thank Tim again. Uh, I want to thank uh, Luke and Ibrahim and Dennis for uh, managing the call and all of you for participating. Uh, this is the first of these forums we'll have. We welcome your feedback on how it can be uh, made better next time. We welcome your suggestions on other participants. And um, until then, uh, I'll say good night. I'll adjourn the meeting. and. Let's get out there and uh, make a better country, people. See you next time. Thanks, everybody. Yep.